Oh, Sip says chapter six. Well, you could tell I make my own slides. I'll have to change that. This is chapter seven, despite what it says right there. Um, it'd be great if the textbook manufacturer would give me that, but that's why this book is free, because they don't have all the goodies that come with it for free for the teachers. Um, that's one other thing I wanted to ask. Do you think the book being free is, is it's, it's worth it? Like, this book doesn't have a lot of frills. It doesn't have pictures. It doesn't have color. But it's it does have good information. I chose it because okay, can't be interested. so. So in your mind, the fact that the book was free is worth. It's worth it to not have the, the a fancy slideshow that comes with it instead of like I'm I'm just going through because it's not a big deal for me. I just make the slideshow and and then in subsequent semesters I'll have it all together. Right? I'll correct my uh, little errors here and there. Um, anyway, all right. So tort law. Uh, so, so, well, I think it's some of the most interesting stuff that we're doing. This is where friends that I've had that are attorneys, most of them work in this field. So the personal injury or the personal harm sort of field. Um, we tend to always think when we think of law of just like criminal law and criminal defense because that's what makes the cool TV shows. Uh, there's actually a book called King of Torts. Uh, John Grisham, uh, he likes to write courtroom thrillers. Uh, that is, it's a pretty good book. It's, it's, a, it's a novel. It's fictitious, but... Um, it might be worth reading if this sort of stuff interests you at all. Um, anyway, so there's the learning objectives for the chapter. As always, I won't read straight through them to you. you hopefully, you, you've read through them. Um, and really, what I'm going to do is try to cover them. All right, so why do we have tort laws? First of all, most tort law is not like we have tort laws, like someone wrote a law that said this is a tort. Instead, tort laws have really arisen out of uh, out of common law, so out of judgments by judges. Think of way back at the beginning of the semester when I talked about the idea that we have this kind of small community, and you know someone steals a cabbage. What, how do we deal with that? You know, if we really had this community with no laws, sooner or later we would have some controversy arise among us, and we'd have to settle it in some way. And so that's really what happens with with common law is is that you take it to court and the judges decide and then other judges rule on similar things and pretty soon you get this body of law um, that that is really driving most of the most tort laws there are some um, le there is some legislation we'll talk about that so tort is a french word which means a r means wrong um, in latin i think it's tortus which actually means crooked as opposed to uh, rectus which means straight um, so it really meant like something that was not right, right? I mean, like, like literally that's what the term meant. Um, and then in the modern court system, usually when you say a tort, you mean a wrong for which the law will provide a remedy. Um, in other words, there's lots of things in the world that are wrong, but only certain things where, which we can really provide remedy for at law. Okay. Uh, and then the, the book breaks it into three types, intentional torts, negligent torts, and strict liability torts. And we'll talk a little bit about each of those. So this I took straight out of the book. Um, and it kind of is how the whole chapter is structured. So that's why I, I stole it from him. I thought it was good. Um, so when we're dealing with tort liability, the first thing we have to kind of figure out is what type is it? Is it, is it strict liability, negligence, or intentional? Then we have to figure out what type of injury. Was it an injury to a person or to property? Then the type of damages we're going to talk about, compensatory or punitive damages. And then excuses. I don't like the word excuses. I think I like the word defenses better. How do we defend ourselves against it? So that's, that's kind of how they have this broken down. Um, and these are all the factors or dimensions that go into tort liability. When they're trying to decide a tort case, they've got to say, okay, was it intentional? Was it negligence? Or was this a, is this a strict liability case? How was someone harmed? What type of damage or what sort of harm occurred to them? And then were there any, any defenses on the part of the defendant? Yeah. So the word punitive, think about the root to it, is, is, is for punishment. So if, if we say... Typically, people, when they sue in a tort case, they're seeking what's called compensatory, compensatory damages. That means I want to be compensated for the harm that was done to me. Uh, you think about you know, a dispute that arises with your neighbor. 
uh, and say let's you you build a fence and then you accidentally go back and figure out the fence is on their side of the property line. Well, probably the best thing you could do would be to bear the cost of moving that fence to the correct place. That everybody would be compensated, nobody was harmed. Maybe fill in the holes on your neighbor's side and you know fix whatever damage you did. That's compensatory in nature. But sometimes we say, look, what this person did was was so bad that that I should receive additional funds from them and it should be punitive in nature. They should be being punished for what they did. That starts to get outside. That starts to sound like criminal, right? Doesn't it sound like the idea that a criminal offense is a harm against everyone? If we're going to punish them. Um, but in some cases, it, it makes sense. Uh, consider something like medical malpractice. If you have a doctor who is continually grossly being negligent and not careful and they continually hurt people, it might make sense to say, in addition to making it right to the best of your ability, we're going to hammer you. We're going to, you know, you're going to pay $3 million uh, because that's going to get you to think twice about being negligent, about being not being careful. That's the idea behind punitive damages. All right. So these are the intentional torts listed in the book. This is not an all-encompassing list, but this is the vast majority of cases fall into these categories. So it, it mentioned in the book that intentional torts are easier to deal with legally because usually, um, or usually, often there are criminal situations that go right along with them. For instance, assault and battery. Uh, and one that's not on there, there's, a, there's an intentional tort called wrongful death. Um, and so in essence, not, if, if you kill somebody, not only can you be tried for murder, which is a crime, the family can also sue you for the tort of wrongful death and say, you're killing our dad is going to deprive us of the income dad would have earned. It's going to deprive us of the love and affection we would have received from him, and we want to be compensated for that. And so for a lot of these there's either a, a criminal sort of uh, parallel or um, or there's some sort of statutory um, rule on, on what makes the makes something an intentional tort. And so that makes them a little easier than negligence torts, which we'll get to. So assault and battery, remember assault is sort of an attempted battery, right? Especially if it's one that puts you in fear. I think the case they talk about in the book is Someone sued a business because one of their employees tried to, to, to lean across the counter and kiss a customer. And he didn't make contact with her, but he still assaulted her. It put her in reasonable fear. Uh, and so, you know, don't try to kiss people unless you know they want to be kissed, I guess. That makes sense to me, right? Um, and battery is, is any sort of physical contact. Remember that we have to say that a harm occurred. So if I bump into you, uh, even if it's on purpose, but I didn't hurt you in any way, it, it becomes muddy as to whether or not you're going to be able to win a case, uh, a tort case. Also, I didn't say this up front, but remember that torts are harms against individuals. So these are civil cases, meaning someone sues you in civil court, not the government. The government doesn't usually bring tort cases against people. Okay, when the government brings a case, it's criminal. Could the government you know, could they say that you were negligent on government property and damaged government government property and we want to receive financial compensation for the property? Sure, they could be a, a litigant in a, in a civil case, but typically, you know, they're, when, when we think of the government bringing suit against you, um, typically we think of criminal, okay? False imprisonment. So this used to mean like I had to lock you in jail, in a, in a jail, but now it's pretty much any restriction of your freedom. Um, if you decided you wanted to leave class and I decided I didn't want you to leave class, what authority do I have to restrain your free movement of leaving this class? How far does it extend? Could I say, hey, if you're going to leave this class, you're going to get a zero for the work we do today? Probably. Okay, that's reasonable, uh, especially because it even flows naturally. We're doing work. If you're not here to do it, then you don't get a grade for it, right? Could I threaten you with something more severe? Like sit down in that chair, I'm going to make you sit down in that chair. Like I didn't say how I was going to make you, I was going to make you by threatening you with a zero. Or I don't know. Um, could I physically restrain you from leaving? Absolutely not. 
right? We hit that point. I've committed uh, probably an, an assault and maybe a battery on you and also false imprisonment. Certainly, if I lock you up in, in one of these offices and, and don't let you leave for a couple hours, that starts to be kind of obvious, right? That that's not cool. Uh, what, what about if, uh, what if I catch you on my property committing a crime? And let's say I point a gun at you and I say, don't move, and I call the police. And I hold you at gunpoint until the police arrive. True. We're not in Texas. Is that false imprisonment? I don't even know if that's a thing, citizen's arrest. I, I think different, different states, different. But, yeah, I, I, is it reasonable for a citizen to detain somebody until the police arrive and the police can sort it out? Most states say yes, okay? Um, they actually have, many states have a statute which is like citizen's arrest. They call it shopkeeper's privilege, uh, which means, like, say I catch you in my store shoplifting. I can detain you until the police arrive and investigate. Um, and as long as I have sort of like a reasonable, like I saw you or I have you on camera, I'm sort of protected from the, the false imprisonment tort. I think the big word is false, right? If there's imprisonment for a reason and it's a legitimate reason, uh, I may be able to do that. But guess what? Like my lawyer friends always say, there's two ways to lose in court. One is to lose in court and the other is to win in court. So if I, in other words, if I get sued by somebody for false imprisonment and I'm totally exonerated, the time, effort, and cost I had to go through to defend myself from that case is still incredibly costly. So I've got to feel like I have a very compelling reason before I'm going to even attempt to imprison somebody. Uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress. Does anybody feel like that sounds like you could be sued if you hurt someone's feelings? That's what it sounds like, right? Um, so just so you know, the tort of intentional infliction of emotional distress is... Um, rarely, rarely won. In other words, the plaintiffs rarely are able to recover any damages for this. In order to do so, they've got to show, this is out of the book, that the, the conduct of the defendant was extreme and outrageous, meaning no normal person would accept that sort of conduct as, as normal. So if you and I get in an argument and we're talking about politics and I don't like your candidate or whatever and I tell you your candidate's an idiot, you can't be like, he told me my candidate was an idiot and it really hurt. I mean, you could say that, but you probably don't have a case for tort against me. Uh, the cases that have been won have been things like, um, let's say you owe me money and I call you and I say, hey, you need to give me that money. And you're like, no. So I go track down your wife at work and I say, if you guys don't pay me that money, uh, I'm going to tell your boss, I'm going to tell everybody else that you're deadbeats. And then another time I send you a letter saying it's going to be really hard to pay your bills to me when you're in jail. And I continue to harass you. I never physically touch you, harm you. That sort of prolonged harassment or extreme harassment might win you an intentional in infliction of emotional distress case. Um, you know, it's one thing to ask somebody for money they owe you. It's another thing to even say, like, look, if you don't, I'm going to turn it over to the county attorney because you're not paying your bills. It's another thing to say harass somebody daily or whatever. Um, trespass, this one's interesting, right? Because trespass, in essence, means going onto someone else's property unlawfully uh, and intentionally, uh, which means if you're walking across a, a farm field that you have permission to be on and you stray into the next guy's field and there was no fence or no boundary between the two, he'd have a hard time getting you for trespass. Um, if you walked up to someone's front door, knocked on their door and said, is so-and-so here? Or said, would you like a copy of this book? And they said, no, thank you. We would not like a copy of that book. And you said, okay, thank you. And you left. They're going to have a hard time getting you for trespass. You, you weren't, you know, it's, it is normal and prudent for people to solicit door to door. What if they put up a no solicitor sign? Well, we're not trying to sell you anything. Right? That's what you guys say, I bet. When someone's like, you ever had anybody open a door and just point at the sign? Shut the door again. <laughs> right? That's, that's how it goes. Um, so trespass, um, some states have statutes that define it more clearly. Um, others, it's kind of like 
a little more nebulous just based on court returns or court uh, um, rulings. So I was reading, if you read in the book, there's a pretty interesting story um, about a guy who had a piece of like abandoned property out in the woods or out in the, you know, wherever. And people would always go in there and like rummage around and like he, he had like old jars and stuff. And so people thought, oh, these are like antiques. So it was pretty reasonable for people to assume it was just abandoned. It was out in the middle of nowhere. It was an old boarded up shack. But around his property, he did have no trespassing signs. Anyway, so he got so frustrated with people coming and, and uh, messing with his stuff and taking things off his property that he decided he was going to set up a trap. And so he attached a 20-gauge shotgun to, the bed, to a bed frame and then rigged up a wire that went from the trigger of the gun through a pulley and back to the door and named the gun low so it would hit someone in the legs if they opened the door. He did not post, like, danger warning. There's, you know, potential death if you open this door. So someone went in there, as someone who'd been in there before. To get in there, they had to pass no trespassing signs and remove boards from the window of this place so that they could climb in through the window. They open the bedroom door, they get shot, and it takes, pretty much destroys one of the legs. A 28 shotgun with bird shot at this distance, right? That's a... So... What do you think? Was he justified in protecting his property in that way? Did he commit some sort of a, a, a crime, A, or a tort? Did he intentionally harm another person? Does the fact that the person was there trespassing negate that fact? Or was sort of the a potentially deadly res response to a fairly benign sort of tort too extreme? What do you think? It, and probably most reasonable people would say that's pretty extreme. You know, was he threatening or endangering any person? No. Um, he was breaking and entering. He was defending his property. Granted, okay. he wasn't there, but he was defending his property. Okay. And, and I, I think I could see that viewpoint. And I think I, I see a few heads nodding, even though they're like, I don't know if I want to say it out loud. Um, but... Um, so the court said that that was an excessive response, and in essence, uh, they charged the homeowner with a crime, uh, which I could see. But I could also see the homeowner saying, well, like, what's my recourse then? What can I do? I've tried everything to keep people out of this property, um, but blowing off one of their legs apparently was too much for that court. Uh, and so anyway, I thought that was an interesting case. Um, So in some states, a trespasser is only protected against the gross negligence of the landowner. In other states, trespassers are owed the duty of due care on the part of the landowner. So in some states, in most states, the idea that they set a trap that hurts you would probably fall under the gross negligence or even intentional sort of situation where you could sue the homeowner. In some states, though, and this is where it gets a little dicier, is some states' laws say that, that uh, a trespasser is owed a regular duty of care that any other person would. So if, even if I'm on your property trespassing and I, let's say, I fall into your pool and drown, my family can sue you because you should have put up a fence or something. Or you, you know, and it's like, but you crossed the fence to get in the yard. But let's say there wasn't a fence. And where it gets even dicier is... What about what if it's a little child? What if your next door neighbor's child wanders in and drowns in your pool? Um, you know, yes, do the parents have a duty to make sure the kid doesn't leave the yard? But if anybody here has ever parented, you know, your kids sometimes you'd be like, where where'd they go? And and they take off. They're quick. It depends on the state, but and and I think it depends on on other factors too. Um, just because a jury might be like less, uh, what's the word, sympathetic to someone who was really trespassing there to do harm, as opposed to someone who accidentally wandered in, um, you know, 
or but when there's no trespassing sign, that sort of takes away that accidentally wandered in argument, right? Um, anyway, yeah. What do you mean? Does it change? Uh huh. Absolutely, your family could sue him for not taking proper precautions to protect you. Even though most people are like, that's lame. You, you know. Now, could he, could he, when we get to the defenses, could he say there was an assumption of risk there? When someone goes swimming in a pond, they recognize it as an inherently dangerous activity? He probably could. And it, you'd, have, you'd have a jury that would have to du duke that out. Um, okay, nuisance is the same idea. Um, not in the book. There's a really famous, not famous case, famous to me, I guess, because because uh, I like, uh, now I can't even think of the name of it. What's the what's the hot sauce that, that they make down in L.A.? Oh, sriracha sauce, right? The, so the sriracha plant in L.A. was producing some pretty noxious fumes, like spicy fumes that would like burn people's eyes and make their eyes water and have a hard time functioning. And so the idea is like, if I'm emanating sort of this nuisance from my property, whether it's noise, whether it's, spicy burning hot sauce, uh, whether it was the KFC that sat next to our church when we lived in Hawaii, that was a dirty trick. Um, you know, fast days when you're not eating and the smell of KFC blows through the windows, it's terrible. I think that's a nuisance. But uh, um, that one's probably not, doesn't count with the other two. Um, but, you know, what, what can I do? Uh, can I enjoin them? Enjoin means get the judge to order them to stop or start a certain behavior. That's what enjoining means. So if I can, can, you know, can I enjoin them to have to somehow contain the noxious fumes that are coming from their property? You know, if I if I'm living next to a feedlot, can we enjoin them to have to keep a certain level of cleanliness so that the flies aren't everywhere? That's the idea behind by a nuisance. And, and a lot of times the law says it has a lot to do with who was there first. If you moved in next to a feedlot, well, guess what, dummy. You're going to have flies. If they moved in next to you and they knew that you had a house, do you have a right to the reasonable enjoyment of your property without? Probably. So that's the idea behind nuisance torts. Um, intentional interference with contractual relations. This just means other people had a contract and you messed with their contract uh, in, in a way that damaged one of the parties. Like say I induced you to, you know, you guys had an agreement and you'd made this agreement and you were going to pay her five dollars for every one of her whatever she was selling, and and I came in and said, "Hey, I will pay you a hundred dollars for him if you agree to not sell to her." You already have a contract in place. Now, if I came to both of you and said, "I'm willing to pay her a hundred dollars for these, but I'm also willing to compensate you five dollars a piece for him too for doing nothing other than agreeing to let go of this contract or buy you out of the contract," that's totally legal, right? If I offer to buy you out so that but if I come in and try to induce you in some way out of the contract, that's called contractual interference, or, or that's the word from our book, intentional interference with contractual relations. Malicious prosecution, this is, this is when the government prosecutes you for a crime and had no probable cause to do so. I think a good example we've seen in the news in the last few years was where the IRS They've now proven the IRS was maliciously going after some conservative groups. Um, when they can look at the math and say, you were auditing these groups at a rate of like 10 times greater than, than liberal groups. What's that all about, right? And so, you know, it started with that. That's how someone noticed it. And then as they start questioning people and, and investigating it, you have people saying, yeah, we were directed to specifically go after certain groups. That's malicious prosecution. Right, to go after someone not because they broke the law, but because you don't like them or something like that. It used to be that there would always be kind of stories of that happening in small towns, right, where the local cops don't like so somebody, so they're arresting them and charging them with crimes. Um, there's versions of this that aren't necessarily prosecution, but sort of malicious interference. Um, you see a lot of where spouses will call DCS on an ex-spouse and report child abuse without any real evidence of it, just to make their life miserable or just to, you know, so that then they can go in and try to get full custody of their kids. And so if, you, if you're sending DCS to investigate your ex-spouse constantly without any real cause to do so, they could probably sue you for malicious 
interference in, in their life. Does that make sense? Uh, people do. People are mean sometimes, right? Um, anyway, defamation. Has anybody ever heard of that one? You know what defamation is? Chandler? Mm -hmm. And it's not enough to just say bad things. They have to be false bad things. You can say bad things that are true all you want. You could, yeah. Well, or you could say bad things that are an opinion. Like, I think Mike Fox's shirt is ugly. I think it makes his belly look big. And I'm like, no, my belly is what makes my belly look big. Um, but, you know, you could say that because, you know, but you can't, if you were to say, um, accuse me of cheating on my spouse and then say that in this public forum and then that harms me, which probably would, right? Then I would have a defamation case. Um, uh, the terms that they use is if, if defamation is written, um, they'll call that uh, libel, like if it's published in a newspaper, and if it's spoken, it's, they call it slander. Um, the rules for defamation is that something has to be published, but published could be something as simple as saying it in front of other people or posting it in Facebook, okay? And so if you say something false about somebody that hurts them, then you've committed defamation and they could sue you for that. And that seems reasonable, right? Like, but there has to be harm. It can't just be it hurt my feelings. If there's got to be actual harm. There's also certain things that are called, it's called privileged communication. So any privilege in court or in government proceedings. So if I testify in court and I, and, and I tell what I believe to be the truth, I cannot be sued for that. Okay. Now, if it can be shown that I was lying and knew I was lying, then I can, well, I've committed a crime called perjury, actually. Um, but so that's what defamation is. Uh, and then the last one there, invasion of privacy. How many of you did the court case? Well, I just forgot the name of it. Where Connecticut came after the, the runners of the, of the Planned Parenthood group. Yeah, what was the name of the case? Anybody remember? Griswold v. Connecticut, right? So before Griswold v. Connecticut, the, the notion that there was such a thing as the right to privacy was, was just absent from the law. It doesn't mean it was absent from the way people thought and felt, right? I mean, man, I, I, when I do stuff in my office here at work, I sort of feel like I, it's my own private space. But it's not. The cleaning lady has keys. Uh, most people in this division have keys to each other's offices, which is nice. If you forget your keys, your, your friend can let you in, right? So it's not really a private space, but it still feels private. So I think the, the notion of wanting privacy has always been there. But a legal precedent for it happened in Griswold v. Connecticut. Um, and so in a tort situation, it's a little different than in a government sort of criminal situation. Um, but some examples they talk about here in the book. Um, let me just read this to you. It says, courts and commentators have discerned at least four different types of interests. One, the right to control the appropriation of your name and likeness for commercial purposes. So someone can't, like, make a, a flyer that says, like, Mike Fox approves me for e ASEAC president, right, without my permission to do so, because my likeness belongs to me. So what's that? Should have done that, because that was, you'd be an absolute automatic winner if, if I endorsed you, because, uh, I mean, who doesn't love me? It's mostly because of my humility. Um, so that's the first, the right to control appropriation of your likeness uh, and name. Two, the right to be free of intrusion on in your personal space or seclusion. This is not really solid what that means. What's your personal space? Certainly your home. Um, but we've, there's been employers who have tried to sue their employees because I'm sorry, employees who have sued their employers because the employer um, read their emails that were on the, the employer's server. Like, so my michael.fox at eac.edu, is that for my exclusive use or does it belong to the college? And can they review it if they want to? And the answer over and over has been, it's theirs. Okay, they, they pay for the server and they tell you up front. How about your monsters.eac.edu? Do you have any right to assume that, that the content that goes through that is private? Kind of. 
I bet you there was some fine print somewhere that you clicked, I agree. Even Google, by the way, right? They look through stuff. They have, they have computers that look at the words that are in your emails, and that defines the banner ad that you're going to see on the side. Can they do that? Yeah, you agree to it, actually, so if they can. Um, same with Facebook, right? Um, I'm always surprised at people who are surprised that, like, their Facebook stuff wasn't private. And I'm like, if the whole nature of Facebook is posting it out there for the whole world to see. But that's, that's the second one. So third, freedom from public disclosure of embarrassing and intimate facts of your personal life, even if they're true. So this is different than defamation. This would be the, the standard they've used is, in essence, to say, if it is something that is private in nature, even if it's true, let's say your tax returns. Let's say you carry yourself like you're an important member of the community, but your tax returns show a different picture. And so be, because I, and I, I get a hold of those, and I publish them out there for the whole world to see that you're really broke. Could that harm you in some way? Maybe. So that's the idea behind that, okay? Um, and the fourth one they had in the book was the right to not be presented in a false light. In other words, for people to make you look bad. Again, would it be hard to get recovery on this? You'd have to demonstrate again that it damaged you in, in some way. And typically by damage, it doesn't mean hurt your feelings. It means harmed you financially or harmed you in such a catastrophic way, like could something hurt your feelings to the point where it causes physical damage to you? I mean, have you ever heard of people with, like, becoming so anxious about something that they they can't sleep, they're throwing up, they're, it does happen, right? So I think if you could have a judge say, this person spun into this spiral of depression because of these events, I mean, had a doctor say that and, and a jury believe it, you might have a case uh, because that really does happen. Um, all right, that's enough on intentional torts. You get the point. Yes. Yes. Um, I think it is. I don't, I'll be honest with you and say I don't know what legal precedent there is for winning that. Um, I think if, if, if someone's spouse cheated with someone else, I think you'd have a case for, for like tortious contractual interference against the, the, the person they cheated with, that they, in essence, enticed them away from a contractual obligation. But that's what I'll ask an attorney friend, because I, I can't give you, like, I can give you my opinion, but not what the body of law has been. Oh, yeah. Sure, sure. Right, because because most of the time the reasonable and prudent principle sort of applies and you realize it's a friend being goofy instead of someone trying to harm you, right? I mean, how many times, you don't have to answer this, how many times have you trespassed? I have. Everybody like gets a little smile, like I remember that time. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, we, we all have, have probably done those so negligence so negligence means that you did something on accident so or by you know not being careful um so if we were to kind of think of this as a continuum we'd have to start with intentional and then we'd move to negligence Yes. Right. So the opposite of intentional would be completely accidental. You can't read my handwriting, I know. And unforeseeable. Right? Either you, like if you do something on purpose, the opposite of that is I did it, I did not do it on purpose and I couldn't really foresee a danger at all. I was doing everything right and you still got hurt. 
And then negligence is in the middle of that, saying, okay, you didn't intentionally hurt somebody, but your actions or the situation was foreseeable. You could have done something to prevent this, and you didn't. Okay, such as when you mop the floor, you could minimize the chance of someone slipping by putting a sign there that says wet floor, right, or whatever. So the standard of care is that a reasonable person, in fact, the tort law or the, 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 the common law out there still says a reasonable man, that's how old it is, that you should act in a way that a reasonable person would act. You should have the duty of care or standard of care that a normal person would have. Like, so a normal person would say, hey, I've just dug this hole. It's potentially dangerous to people. I'm going to, you know, put some warning signs around it that say, be careful, there's a hole here. That's reasonable because it's foreseeable that somebody could fall in that hole. If the hole hasn't been there all the time and now there's a hole there, we'd want to let people know or that the floor is wet or whatever. Um, so the elements of negligence are that you had a duty of care, you breached that duty, and that your breach of that duty caused damages. So that's what I would have to prove to sue you for negligence. Duty of care, that's pretty obvious, right? You had a, an obligation to to warn or let someone know and that you breached that. You didn't do what you're supposed to do. Causation is a little weird because you have to prove both what's called actual cause and proximate cause. So actual cause means you have to be able to prove that if they had not either done the thing they did or not, you know, not done the thing they should have done, that without that, then the damage wouldn't have happened. That's what actual cause means. They actually call it the but-for test. They'll say, but for this happening, this wouldn't have happened. Or but for this happening, this would have happened. So that's the first thing you have to prove, that what they did actually led to your being harmed. The second thing you have to prove is what's called proximate cause. Proximate means like proximity, like the near cause. Um, so that, that it was a foreseeable and not too remote thing. So even if, let's say, um, the butcher shop, or let's say back at the, 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 the farm where they raised the chicken, that the chicken had some sort of a disease on it that they should have done something about, but that they didn't. That chicken gets butchered and put into the food system. Then that food, that chicken comes to the restaurant. And if the restaurant would cook the chicken to a certain temperature according to USDA guidelines, then there would have been no risk to the customer you would say there was an actual cause all the way back at the chicken farm or chicken ranch or whatever you call it where chickens are raised that led to this person getting sick, but the proximate cause was probably the restaurants failing to cook the chicken all the way through. So this is what makes it hard sometimes in negligence cases. Because what you want, so what they normally do is they'll sue the restaurant, they'll sue the distributor of the chicken that the restaurant bought the chicken from, They'll sue the the you know ranch or the, the trucking company that brought the chicken there, and then the ranch that raised the chickens, um, and then it'll settle in the case where the where the proximate cause really is. Or sometimes they'll say there were multiple, and you have to show that it hurt you, damaged you in some way financially. Your defenses to negligence: the first is what's called contributory negligence. This is almost not anywhere anymore. A few states still have it. The idea is if my actions harm you, but your actions contributed to that harm, then I'm not liable. So let's say we both go out drinking. Then we decide to go for a ride on your boat. We're both drunk. I stand up in the boat and I fall into the water and in the process I my leg gets cut up by the propeller on the boat, uh, something like that. In a state that has contributory negligence laws, in essence, you could say he was at fault because he stood up on the boat and he fell in. Yeah, I was at fault too. I shouldn't have been drunk driving my boat. 
But in those states, they would say, in essence, each person's liable for their own damages. What they found is that that standard was just too much, too rigid, too often, to say that just because the person acting, the plaintiff, the person bringing the suit, was partially responsible for their own injury, that the other person was not responsible at all. So what they did is many states have passed statutes that allow for what's called comparative negligence. And that's where they say, okay, they try to determine through this sort of court process how much of the damages were the responsibility of the plaintiff and how much were the responsibility of the defendant. And it, sometimes it's wacky. It'll come out and be like, okay, so 30% of the damages were the plaintiffs and 70% were the defendants. So if the total cost of, of the medical treatment was $100,000, the defendant will be, will be responsible for 70% of those. So it's some attempt to, to, comparative negligence was just some attempt to kind of wipe away the, 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 the blank slate that contributory negligence caused. Assumption of risk, this means you were participating in an activity that you knew to be unsafe. That's why when you go do something stupid like jump out of an airplane, they usually have you fill out a form, right, that says, I understand that this is dangerous. Even something not stupid like playing in soccer. When you play soccer, are you aware that people get hurt playing soccer? Especially if they're playing against Chandler, he'll come chop you up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's pretty physical, he'll come attack you. Absolutely. Right. So it, actually, the textbook li breaks down assumption of risk in an interesting way. It says there's a, there are there's a few three different ways that you can sort of use the defense of assumption of risk. The first is the plaintiff may have formally agreed with the defendant before entering into a risky situation that he will relieve the defendant of liability should injury occur. So that's like the form they have you fill out, right? That's and a lot of times if you see it, it'll say assumption of risk at the top, meaning you're actually agreeing, I understand what I'm doing is dangerous and I release you from any, any damages. The second is the plaintiff may have entered into a relationship with the defendant knowing that the defendant was not in a position to protect him from known risks. The example they give in the book is if you go to a Major League Baseball team and you buy a seat on the third baseline, you know a bunch of foul balls are coming your way. And there's no way they could protect you adequately from that. I guess they could put a net up, but that'd make everybody mad because you're there because you want to try to catch foul balls, right? So if you want to be in the spot where you're going to have foul balls coming at you and a chance to catch them, then you know that's risky, okay? And then the third is the plaintiff may act in the face of a risky situation knowing in advance to have been, uh, to have been created by the defendant's negligence. Uh, the example they give is probably kind of like my drunk guy driving the boat. Getting in a car with a drunk person driving, you knew that was risky up front. Can you still sue them? Yeah. Might it limit the damages? It might. Okay. Um, other, uh, other defenses include what's called uh, force majeure or an act of God, uh, which means it's not really negligent if lightning strikes just because you're sitting on the guy's property when it happens. There's nothing he could have done to protect you from that. Okay. And then what's called vicarious liability or respondent superior. Um, which means, um, in essence, this is where you claim, this often happens in business, where you're acting as an agent for the business, and then you do something bad, and you say, look, a wrong that harms somebody else, you say, you're going to have to actually sue my boss, because I was acting as an agent for my boss. Um, you know, when a doctor is doing surgery on behalf of the hospital, who's responsible? Um, that's why most people sue both the doctor and the hospital and let the courts decide that, okay? Doctors are a little different because they're independently licensed. All right, we're out of time. There's only one other concept, um, which as you're cleaning up, I'll explain. Uh, this is what's called strict liability. This is liability without fault, that even when the defendant does everything right, you could still sue them. And this is things called, such as ultra-hazardous activities, when a business is engaged in ultra-hazardous things like, say, creating 
toting around sulfuric acid, if that acid spills, even if they did everything right and someone crashed into them, they might still be able to get sued by the city for the damage that acid causes because they knew they were engaged in a super hazardous or ultra hazardous activity. Um, it also happens when somebody's animals, say, get out of their pen or their yard and do damage to someone else's property. Even if they maintained the fence and everything else, even if another car crashed into the fence and that animal was able to escape, you might still get sued along with the guy who crashed into your fence because keeping animals is risky. Um, this is why Jurassic Park was a bad idea. And last is product liability, same thing. Even if you make your product right, if it hurts somebody, you may be held uh, liable. We'll have a whole chapter on product liability. You'll love it. Have a great day. Sorry I took so long. But this stuff's fascinating.